Thank you for joining us for this episode of Frog Talk, an Auction Frogs podcast series all about events and fundraising in a post-2020 world. For more information on Auction Frogs and the services we offer, visit auctionfrogs.org today. Well, welcome again to another edition of Frog Talk, your leap into fundraising. I'm Corey Michaels and joined by Helena with Make-A-Wish Idaho today. Helena, why don't we start with what were you thinking last year when the whole world was all upside down? Right. Well, um, luckily, you know, when when the world sort of shut down in March of last year, um, we were still about six months away from our event. So we did have a little bit of time to decide and and just kind of take the time to decide what we were going to do. Um, and as we got closer to the date, which ended up being, um, you know, around the first week of October, um, we figured out that it really needed to be virtual, that there was no way that we could do an in-person event. Um, and just for us and for the safety of our guests, and we just felt it was prudent to um, just pivot and uh, I'm beginning to hate that word, but, um, uh, you know, know. <laughs> make those changes and um, and do what was right for uh, our guests as well as for the company and, and going forward. So. And, and how did you decide upon Auction Frogs? Well, we have worked with Auction Frogs for, oh gosh, I, on this event, uh, the event is called Serving Up Wishes, and it's mm-hmm. our largest gala event of the year. And gosh, I don't know how many years we've been working with Auction Frogs, at least seven, eight, maybe even a decade. So okay. for us, it was an easy decision um, to use auction, fro- auction Frogs. And I love, you know, you got, you're a hometown company. I know you guys work all around the country, but um, we love working with Christy and your team and her team and um, just felt like, it, uh, uh, you know, keep it local. You know, was what we always try to do. So, well, we sure do appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So, how was your first virtual event experience? It went really well. I mean, we had, of course, tailored our budget um, to be less than probably what it would be is if we were to have an in person event, um, just because we weren't sure how it was going to go. And actually, we made about $25,000 more than we anticipated that we had budgeted for. So it went great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, it's always a little nerve wracking going into it, not really n- knowing how many people are going to watch, who's going to be engaged, is it going to feel a little bit like what we've done before or do we even just scrap you know scrap that idea and just know that it is going to be what it is it is going to be a virtual event um and trying to keep what was special about serving up um you know intact and at least as as intact as it could be going forward so we were able to take some of the elements um, from serving up, bring it to the virtual event, which was really fun to work on and then have it, uh, you know, have it here in your studio, uh, which worked really great. I loved having it here because then we didn't, you know, it was already set up for us. It was, you know, actually the day and night of the event was, you know, so much more comfortable and relaxing than, what it, you know, what it usually is, um, for me anyway. Um, but yeah, it worked. It was great. And, and what did you learn? through the right. process? Gosh, um, learned a lot. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that I would say went well, and then there's things that I would, you know, continue or change. So I think for us, um, what we learned is that our MCs um, are, were super important, the people who hosted um, the virtual event. We did a mixture of live and recorded, pre-recorded content. So uh, Larry Flynn and Mark Johnson were our hosts, and they've worked together for so long. And it was great to have two people, not just one person up there talking, but two right. people going back and forth. People who had no people who know Make a Wish um, are deeply connected to the, this event, and I think that was really great because they were still able to bring that out um, during that night um, because they're with us for you know have been with us for the last several serving up wishes. So um, that felt great and comfortable. Um, I think, you know, this, your staff um, working with Auction Frogs was fantastic. Um, Even though, I mean, arriving, you know, here at the space at four o'clock and then making last minute changes because we knew we had more people to thank or, 
uh, we wanted to switch out some photos and that was really great. Your staff were just like, yeah, we can do that. No problem. It was always no problem. We'll do it. We'll take care of it. So I really love that. <laughs> and then, um, you know, for us focusing on our mission, um, telling our story, uh, having a, uh, you know, I think we had two or three videos where we talked about the impact of wishes on our wish kids, uh, worked really well. Um, I think it went a little long. Um, I, it went about 45 to 50 minutes, which, um, I probably would have liked it to be closer to the 40 minute mark. Um, but you know, I don't know that anybody actually told me that it was too long, but, I don't know. It just felt, you know, just massaging that a little bit would be interesting going forward, I think. Um, and then having the being able with Auction Frogs to preview the auction um, in advance. I know that some of our chapters uh, have previewed their auction a month in advance. We actually did it a week and then uh, in advance and then had it open or maybe it was 10 days. Uh, yeah, I think it was 10 days. And then we actually had it open for another two days after the event, which I think was really which was really helpful because it didn't just close once the evening was over, um, that people still had time. And we actually had someone come in and swoop, it, swoop in the next day and got like five items. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, you know, but it worked well. I mean, it just was, you know, having be, you know, giving a chance for people who maybe couldn't join us that night or, you know, just needed those reminders to continue to, to check back on the website, um, to look at those items was, was good. And then, um, yeah, I think going, oh, and, and then we had watch parties. A few of our yes. board members had watch parties, which I think, um, going forward, if we were to do this again, virtually, I would have more watch parties because the, the overwhelming response to those watch parties was that that was really fun. Like, well, yeah. and it adds back some of that personal connection. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, um, you know, we had talked about videoing those, some of those parties in advance, mm -hmm. um, which we didn't, you know, there were a couple of things that we probably could do now that with a little more lead time and now we sort of know what, what it would be. But, um, and even those watch parties, um, it was still lovely in early October, people could be outside and they moved to television sort of so they could watch it and everybody was on their phones and um, it was, uh, yeah, from what I heard, the watch parties were really fun and really successful. So, um, and, and really contributed to particularly bidding on the live auction items that night. I could really see a difference from where we started in the evening. Um, and I could tell cause I knew who was at the watch parties, you know, who was bidding and who might be encouraging who to bid at the watch parties. So that was really fun to watch too during the evening. Well, and that's one of the things in the, the live galas that, you know, that competitive nature inside the room when yeah. it came to live auction and silent auction as well. And so, uh, yeah, you get a little more of that when it's like, come on, what? Are you yeah. afraid? Go ahead. Yeah. You can do it <laughs> and start getting a little bit of that, uh, you know, the, the that competitive nature in there, but all for a great cause. Yeah. Now, Elena, if, if you were talking to another nonprofit, came up and said, okay, 2021 is <laughs> not looking any better for us having our events. Or, yeah. So I know you used auction frogs. You've done a virtual event. What would you tell them? What advice would you give them? I would say make the decision to go virtual sooner rather than later. Don't wait until the last minute, although you can, and you could probably put together something in a couple weeks. You can. <laughs> um, you can. I would not <laughs> recommend it. <laughs> so I would just bite the bullet and make that decision sooner rather than later. Um, like I said, we had plenty of time, so that was great. Um, so I would say that. I would say, um, you know, stay focused. Don't panic. Uh, it's going to be okay. <laughs> I would say, you know, really think about your mission and how you want to present your mission and your program um, to the community. Um, and just keep that laser focused. Keep it super intentional about how you want to tell your story about your mission and that, that impact. And I think because that will only just encourage people to support you. And so don't get off track. Just keep, keep that, keep that lane 
uh, intact. Um, I would say, you know, communication to your stakeholders. So whoever your table host, your donors, your sponsors, communicate with them as soon as possible. And even if you feel comfortable, bring them in on the conversation and say, you know, what would you like to, if we go virtual, what would you like to see? And how can we include you? And how do you see yourself being included in, in the, this evening? And I'm not talking, you need to talk to 50 people. I mean, if you just right. make 10 phone calls to a couple people that you trust to tell you the truth and what, what uh, they would like to see, then I think that's also um, helpful in helping you to guide what that evening should look like. And um, we found that to be, be very helpful. Um, uh, for us, you know, part of it, we work with Boise State University so closely and the athletes, um, for the, for serving up. So being able to reach out to them and, and including them and having the students, um, rather be in person doing their talent, um, that they would, uh, record it and we would be able to show it, uh, you know, virtually. So that, and having lead time in order to do that and organize that was wonderful. So however you may need to, um, include those, not only the people you serve, but, um, others that support you, um, give them lead time to create videos, to create content, I think was, uh, uh, was really valuable. And then, um, don't think about trying to do it all yourself. <laughs> if you're just one person like me, um, it really wasn't just me. Um, it was my, it was the entire staff of Make-A-Wish. They, you know, they're so helpful. The program team, the CEO, um, marketing, they were, you know, they were just really helpful and, and, you know, you're just make sure that you include everybody because it, it, it's really fun. And, and, um, you know, you'd know, be surprised by somebody who maybe isn't necessarily always doing the job that you do, but they may have some really great ideas. And, um, you know, I always rely on the program team to focus me on, you know, continue to focus me on the mission and what's important and what the kids need. And, and, uh, so I find that to be really valuable. Well, thank you so much for coming in and taking some time. Well, thank you for having me. This was great. It's always lovely to see the people at Auction Frogs. You guys are fantastic. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Frog Talk, an Auction Frogs podcast series all about events and fundraising in a post-2020 world. For more information on Auction Frogs and the services we offer, visit auctionfrogs.org today.